when it comes to the human capital gain, he's about two laps of ahead of where everybody else is. So um, whenever he talks, I just I just shut up and listen and take notes. So uh, I'm waiting for him to come up to the stage. I'm here. Jason, how you doing, brother? Dr. Russ. My it's good man. to see you, my friend. Yes, sir. Ferocia gave us dropped some good nuggets here, man. We got a good flow going. That uh it feels like it. I can feel the energy. So I'm I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to not screw it up. Oh, listen, man. You're the expert. Let me drop off and let you do your thing so I can take notes. Stefan, take me off the screen immediately and, and let the show start. Oh well, first off. Thank you, Dr. Russ, for the the um, completely too um, too generous introduction. Because I prefer generally very low expectations going into things, so that I can jump over those. So this one, I feel like I have to really work now. Um, and thank you for being part of the Inspirathon, man. What twenty four hours of 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 content is pretty mind blowing, and I'm going to try to live up and do something good in my little chunk here. And what I want to talk about today is uh, quiet quitting, right? Seems like everybody's talking about quiet quitting, and this has struck a nerve with people, right? You know, quiet quitting, uh, it's amazing. Like, it's all over the place. In fact, you know, you, you, you go to the web and you do a little quick search for quiet quitting, and, you know, you find all kinds of articles. You've got, you know, World world class economists telling us that quiet quitters are ruining the economy or tanking the economy. You got other people telling us that this is absurd and all of this. And it, it, the interesting thing about quiet quitting, what I have found is everybody I've talked to about this has a take. Everybody's got a take. And and some of my favorites, like I, you know, when I love when I start, I bring this up, and somebody's always got an opinion, right? Some kind of snappy sort of comeback or take on this. And here's some of my favorites. The most common ones I hear, and you've probably heard some of these yourself, is number one, they'll say quiet quitting doesn't seem very quiet to me if they're talking about it on social media. So, right, that's pretty clever. Or the second one is it's not quitting. Stop calling it quitting. You're not quitting your job. It's another like hot take, right? But my favorite, and it's my favorite because it comes from people like us. It comes from people in our industry. It comes from leaders. It comes from HR professionals is why are we renaming something? This is not new. Like this has been around forever. It was disengagement or mailing it in or quitting in place. Like we already had a word for this. This isn't a new thing. Right. All of the hot takes that I'm hearing constantly, all of the articles. I just got another article in my inbox, a uh, uh, newsletter, you know, from another another expert, another talking head like me. And uh, and the headline was quiet quitting is not OK. Right. Everybody's got these hot takes. And here's what they all have in common. They are all wrong. I don't know why. I don't think I've ever seen something that people are getting so consistently wrong, right? The, it seems like the entire business world, the entire employment world, the entire HR world is completely missing the point of what's happening right now with quiet quitting. And fundamentally, here's the biggest thing that people are missing is that quiet quitting isn't something that HR or leaders or managers created, like all of these other labels in the past, mailing it in or, or quitting in place or even disengagement, right? That's the favorite one. Gallup gave us that, I think, initially, or some academic, you know, 30 years ago, disengagement. But this isn't some, this, this quiet quitting didn't come from that. It came from the employees. It came from an employee who went to TikTok because they were exasperated. He was fed up and he's had enough. And he was honest enough to just say, listen, I, I can't do it anymore. And so here's what I'm going to do. And it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where that is the fundamental truth of this that we're missing is that this is a, is something that employees are calling out. And you're right. It's not a new thing. 
this has been happening probably for as long as work has existed. People have been quiet quitting, but it's something that the newer generation or a younger generation or the TikTok generation, whatever we want to call them, they put a name on it. They they have the courage to say the quiet stuff out loud. And so they've been willing to talk about this. And so they started talking about it. And instead of listening, we blame. We blame. Right. Those it, we start we start heaping this on like those dang quiet quitters are ruining the 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 economy. They didn't just start quiet quitting. This group's just being honest about it. People have been quiet quitting for decades. And so I think we need to step back. Let's zoom back for a minute and let's take a look at this phrase and let's listen to what's actually being said, because I think rather than piling on and blaming and telling people to cut it out, get back to work, which is a very traditional BS top-down response. If we pay attention, we would hear that this is an invitation. It's a wake-up call. Because I think quiet quitting is a perfect name for it. Because if you really pay attention, it, it's, it helps you understand this cry for help that's coming from our employees. So let's, let's break it down. What does it mean? And I'm going to shift my view here quickly for you. So let's start with quitting. What does this group mean when it's quitting? And I realized that I just cut my head off. So I'll, I'll get down here so you can see me for a minute. I didn't know that was going to be there. All right, quitting. What does quitting mean when they're saying quiet quitting? Well, it means I'm not willing to work to the point of burnout without any appreciation. Uh, it's not clear to me how much is enough. And it's really not worth it to keep working like this. Or, you know what? I need to set some boundaries. Or I'm opting out of the hustle culture, right? That is what they're saying. And the sad part is, is that they think this is quitting. This feels like quitting because of the message they're getting from management, from the organization. That alone is a pretty troubling thing. But let's talk about the quiet part because the quiet part is actually even more concerning, I think, because when they're saying quiet, it's not that they're not going to talk about it. They might go to social media. They're going to talk to their friends about it. This is nothing new. People have been doing this. The quiet part is that they don't feel safe to talk to the people at work about this. They don't feel safe to talk to the people that could actually do something about it because they think there'll be penalties because they think they'll be met with the reaction that seems to be everywhere in the media. Well, who can blame them for feeling like, I can't talk about this. I can't bring this up. So I'm gonna have to quietly kind of just work my way through it. Right, or maybe they did try to talk about it and nobody did anything or nobody listened or maybe they just don't even feel like anybody's paying attention. And so quiet quitting, yeah, quiet quitting is a perfect name for it. This is not a problem. And so we need to stop blaming. And what if I if I sort of summarize it for you, if we if we zoom back, so here's what here's what the employees are saying broadly. And if you if you don't believe me, you can go fact check this. Go find one of the TikToks, any of the billion TikToks out there about quiet quitting, or go find an article about it, or go find anywhere. You can go to my YouTube channel. I did a video about quiet quitting. The, the comment stream underneath that video is really informative about where people are at. And that's where you really learn what the real story is. Rather than listening to you know, somebody spouting off about what they think is going on, go listen to what employees are actually saying. And what and when you when you kind of sum it all up, what they're saying is, you know what, the way work is being managed isn't working for me. It seems like they're expecting me to work to the point that I'm going to fall over or that I'm going to burn out. And if I talk to anybody about it, it feels like I'm putting my career at risk. So I'm just going to show up to work, do what's minimally expected of me, and then I'm going to get on with my life because this isn't worth it. And here's my question. Why is this a problem? Right? Because if I'm running an organization or I'm leading a big team or whatever, and my employees are saying to me, you know what, I'm just going to show up to work every day. I'm going to do what's expected. And then I'm going to go home and I'm going to invest time in the things that matter most to me to keep me happy. 
Amen. I'll take a whole bunch of those. That's in fact, in your organization, I would bet today that if you, if every, if every employee committed to that, performance would skyrocket in your organization. Why is this a problem? If this is a problem, if your leaders and managers are concerned about quiet quitters, concerned about people saying, I'm only going to do what's expected of me, guess what? That means you've got two really big problems going on potentially, or one of two. Number one, you're not clear on expectations, right? Because if your people are committed to meeting expectations so that they keep their job and that's a problem, then your expectations are too low or they're not clear. People don't know what it is. Maybe managers don't even know what it is. And so because we don't know how much is enough, we don't know what's expected and the employees don't know what's expected. We just expect to max them out. That's a problem. That's a problem. Or number two, maybe you are clear on expectations, but you're not managing to those expectations. You're not creating accountability. You're not offering feedback. You're not you know, doing anything to follow up on that. So when we hear about quiet quitting and we hear people talking about quiet quitting, and if this is a big deal in your organization, it's not the problem. The problem is that you are not managing your people effectively. Fix that. We need to fix that. Because quiet quitting has been around forever and it's not going anywhere until we create better organizations, better work experiences, better managers. It's not the manager's fault. We never trained them to do this effectively. And now when employees are reacting to the fact that they're in a tough situation, when they're giving words to how they feel, they're being brave enough to sort of send out a cry for help. We need to hear it and we need to respond and we need to equip our managers to create a better, a better opportunity. Because here's the beauty of quiet quitting is that they're not for real quitting. They're still in your organization and they're one click away from being engaged. They're one click away from coming back into the fold. They're one click away from being everything you want them to be. But you got to listen and show up for them. And so let's talk about what that looks like. How do you get them back sort of where you want them? How do we get them back engaged? How do we get them out of their mentality of quiet quitting back to sort of just being engaged in their role and doing their work and not feeling like they have to quit or have to hide, which is really what this is about. So number one, here's my call to you. And this feels like today is a little bit of a public service announcement is that I would invite you to join me in pushing back on this BS about quiet quitting. We need to reframe this conversation. Stop blaming employees. Stop putting this on employees. Because all that is, is we're just trying to distract from the fact that we suck at managing performance. And we're not invested in engaging these people. And it's easier to blame them than it is to do the work to fix what's really wrong. So we got we to gotta reframe this. When somebody starts dumping on quiet quitters or somebody starts pointing the finger at the employee as if it is their fault, right? We're going we're gonna to blame them for giving voice to how they feel about their work experience. You got to push back. We got to push back. We got to start having a conversation about what's underneath this and do the work to fix it. So number one, like reframe it, push back. Number two, let's create greater clarity about what's expected at work. I've already talked about this, but what this means is that if you want to sort of neutralize quiet quitting being a problem, then get really crystal clear about what is expected of the individual at work. What's expected of you in terms of your output? So we're going to pay you. We're going to offer benefits. We're going to create, you know, we have all this stuff we're going to give you in exchange for work product. That employee should be crystal clear about what good enough looks like. You know, what does success look like? How is that measured? And that can be work output. It also should be if, if how I do my job or the way I behave when I'm doing my job, that should also be part of what you what you define and create clarity. And guess what? It's not just about having the conversation. This is where you have to use what I call the golden rule of management, which is if it matters, put it in writing. 
So all of this that I just talked about, every employee should have in writing sort of what is the expectation of their role? What is required to succeed, to keep your job? And if that's calibrated correctly and you're managing to that, then quite quitting isn't a problem, right? Because they'll know where the line is. And if they're delivering on that and, they, and that's it, great. You expect more than that? Well, then recalibrate expectations. Or if you expect them or want them to go above and beyond, then talk about what the reward is for that. Why might they want to do that? Have those conversations. Create clarity. So that's number two. The last piece is you've got to start teaching managers or we as managers have to start learning how to really meaningfully check in with people. Meaningfully check in. Now, I don't have time to go through a, a class for you here today about, you know, sort of the full sort of check-in method that I teach to managers, but I'm going to give you the quick version because a, a really high impact, meaningful uh, check-in conversation basically has four components or four steps. And here's what they are. Number one, you need to ask a great question. It starts with a great question. Now, a great question is one that demands a response that invites a follow-up question. That's a great question. So let me give you an example of a not great question. Not great question is asking, hey, how are you? Now, I, that seems like it might be a great question to ask in a check-in. It's not a great question because what do you usually hear when, when you ask someone, how are you? You hear fine, good, busy. My, my son's favorite response is decent. But what does that tell me? Doesn't tell me much. Does that invite me to follow up? What's the follow up when they say fine? Right? It's really hard to follow up because the fine is I'm, I don't want to talk about it. A great question invites some information that invites a follow up, right? It requires that. Let me give you another example of a terrible check in question. Hey, how are you coming on that project? Now, number one, it's not a good check-in question because it doesn't require an answer that invites the follow-up because they might say, fine, good. What, what does that tell you? What are you going to follow up on there? But it's also a micromanaging question, right? So don't ask that question. It undermines trust. If they had problems, they'd be telling you. Or if you don't have confidence in them to complete it, then deal with that. Coach with that differently. So don't ask those. Those are bad questions. A great question sounds like this. My favorite great check-in question is this. How are you on a scale from 1 to 10? 10 being couldn't be better, 1 being couldn't be worse. Where are you at today? Now, no matter what the number is, that number doesn't tell you anything specifically, but it requires or invites a follow-up, doesn't it? So if you say 8, or if you say five or you say two, you got to follow up on that. What, is this, what does an eight mean or what is a five? So, so a question, you know, if they say I'm at a two, you're going to say, wow, sorry to hear that. Tell me more about that. What's going on? So that is step two, ask the follow-up. So you ask a great question. The great question requires a follow-up. You ask the follow-up. And then number three might be the most important part of the process. Shut up. And listen, listen like your life depends on it. Listen like their career depends on it and their performance depends on it because it does. If you ask a great question, you ask the follow-up, then that'll open up a conversation with that employee where you will hear what you need to hear. You'll get to the conversation that really matters and you get there quickly. And if you're listening and you're asking additional follow-ups and you're paying attention, then you can effectively do step four, which is, offer support, encouragement, or help. Four steps. Great question. Ask the follow-up. Shut up and listen. And then offer support, encouragement, or help. Whatever it is they need. So I know the next question you're having is like, okay, great. Uh, what about great questions? What are other great questions? Well, I have a resource for you. And let me, I'm going to bring this actually up to full screen for you. Um, You'll see here, we created a, a download for you that is 18 great, it's basically a cheat sheet, 18 great check-in questions for check-in conversations. 
Um, there's 18 questions in here. All of them are the kinds of questions that in, sort of require that response that invites the follow-up. They're sorted into some different categories. You can download it for free at this, uh, at this URL. And if you download that, um, you'll you'll get you can use that not only to improve your own check-ins, but also you can share it and use it to coach others to help them start having better check-in conversations. Because the reality is, um, all of this, like combating quiet quitting, if we were having better conversations with our people, if we were asking great questions and really listening and following up in those conversations. They wouldn't need to go to TikTok to talk about quiet quitting. They wouldn't need to go vent about it elsewhere on social media because they'd be talking to their manager about it and their manager would be trying to do something to fix it. So let's reframe. Let's take this invitation, this moment today, and let's reclaim the conversation about quiet quitting because there's so much nonsense out there and we need to push back on it. We need to stop blaming employees for giving voice to the experience they are having at work. We need to honor that truth, honor that call for help, see it as a call to action. And finally, finally, let's take some action to fix the root cause. Let's manage better. Let's lead better. Let's create better systems so that we don't have a world where employees feel like they have to quiet quit anymore. We can do it. I hope you're with me. If you wanna reach out for any information about how I could help you do this, or if you wanna talk, my email is here on the screen, jason at jasonlortzen.com or jasonlortzen.com is my website. Hit me up, come find me, I would love to chat.